director to begin start this and um, to give us a global perspective of what God's doing and to frame um, the discussion for today. So, Mr. Fred, if you would take it away. Hey, good to see all of you. Um, an honor to be here. Uh, I've been involved with uh, ministry of Muslims for 50 years now. Um, it wasn't easy for me. I'll just tell you honestly, I first encountered Muslims when I was 20 years old, I'd moved to Berlin, Germany. There was a large uh, guest worker contingent of people from Turkey. And the Turks who were in Berlin back then in 72, 73, that era, uh, were, you know, lower class. They were violent. They, sections of the city where the Turks lived, you know, it was like a no-go zone. So my initial um, contact with Muslims was not very friendly and not very favorable. And I was an atheist communist at the time. It wasn't until I became a Christian where God began to soften my heart towards the Muslims because I read the Bible. And of course, you know that uh, most that where Islam really traces its roots is back to Abraham what we really have in the world is the fractured family of Abraham, you know, Jews, Christians, Muslims, all descend from Abraham. And um, Abraham was calling out to God. I remember reading in Genesis 17, 20, right? Abraham's calling out to God about his son Ishmael, you know, because God had said Isaac is the son of the promise. And God made a promise to Abraham saying, and as for in Genesis 17, 20, and as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. Oh, I'm going to share my screen with you all. That will probably, there we go. Um, I will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. So God does did bless Ishmael and his descendants. That's uh, most of the Muslims today. And so when I read that in scripture, I said, I've got to get a heart for these people, even though I'd had violent encounters with Turks in Germany at the time. I'm just speaking about my experience there at the time, which was very limited. Um, and it was not pleasant. You know, my life was threatened on numerous occasions. So it took me a while to pray that God would give me a heart for the Muslims. And once I received a heart for the Muslims, I began ministering to the Turks in Berlin and winning some to Christ. It was very fruitful. Um, I believe we're in a season that could be the greatest harvest the world has ever seen. You guys could be. Um, we're moving into a multipolar world. I've talked about that before. The shift hasn't happened yet. When the U.S. currency stops being the reserve currency of the world and when uh, bandwagoning uh, happens in international relations, when you see Iran, China, and Russia all together launch a coordinated attack somewhere, you know, we've shifted into a multipolar world and world war will start, no doubt. I believe we'll see that probably before the end of this decade. In any event, we're not there yet. And, and the world will go one of two ways. We'll go into global war where it's going to be very difficult to evangelize, or we'll go into a time of, I believe, the greatest harvest the world has ever seen. And I believe our greatest um, target our, of the gospel, target of redemption, needs to be the Islamic world, um, both Hinduism and Buddhism, the other two major uh, non-Christian religions, they are not violent. Uh, and they're also, yeah, they're not violent. So Islam tends to produce people who are violent. In fact, Islam was birthed in, uh, uh, well, it has their, their violence at its origins. You guys, so let me just share a little bit as as about the context of what we're seeing. Okay, so there's 1.6 billion billion Muslims in the world, mostly without access to the gospel in their culture and language. In fact, uh, researchers at the Center for the Study of Global Christianity say 
that the biggest factor in winning unreached people to Christ is, are there Christians living with them that they interact with and know? So because the gospel is bridged by relationship, you know, our religion is a relational religion. For God so loved the world that he sent a satellite. So our dear friends, CBN and TBN and Daystar can preach the gospel to the whole world. That's now a God said, appreciate that they're doing that, but the gospel's incarnational. Jesus came in the flesh. It's Christians interfacing with Muslims on a day-to-day -day basis that is the most effective in winning them to Christ. The majority of Muslims, about 85%, have never met a Christian, do not know a Christian, and there are no Christians anywhere near them. So mission is the key. Uh, to reaching the Muslim world, 1.6 billion of them that really need Jesus, okay? There are two branches of Islam. Uh, you probably know 85 to 90% are Sunni Muslims, and 10 to 15% are Shia Muslims. Um, and this is really a problem within Islam that spills out into the world. At the death of Muhammad, he did not leave a clear heir. And so there was a fight in Islam and who should be the heir of, of Muhammad. Uh, the, the sect we now call the Sunnis uh, said it should be the most spiritual person. Uh, the, those that we call the Shia now said, no, it must be a relative of Muhammad. And they wanted his cousin and son-in-law, Ali, to be the next leader. And that became this great split and fight and eventually the Sunni side won and appointed a man named Abu Bakr. And this began the Sunni-Shia split, which was violent from the beginning. Um, in fact, the Sunnis consider the Shia essentially um, an extreme sect or maybe even a cult, like we would look at the Muslims, depending on uh, which branch of, of Sunnis you're talking about. So there's been a very violent um tendency within islam between this sunni shia split we need to understand it to really understand the world to understand lebanon uh as our brother was talking about and so so much of the rest of the world what's going on here's a map um you see the tan area are the sunni areas the red areas are the shia areas and what you see is that iran and saudi arabia iran is the capital of of shia islam um, Saudi Arabia is the capital of Sunni Islam, and these have been fiercely, com fiercely competitive throughout all the history of Islam. In fact, some historians say that the most violent dynamic in all of history is the Sunni-Shia split. You add up the world wars, you add up everything, and it doesn't match the fighting between the Sunnis and Shia over all of history. I haven't researched to know if that's true, but I know a number of his, uh, historians say that. There are challenges uh, in, in reaching uh, Muslims, especially those of us from the West. And cross-cultural missions is critical, um, as well as, you know, people in the regions sharing Christ. But there are not enough Christians in the Muslim regions to relate enough to the Muslim, to the vast majority of Muslims to win them to Christ, we must have cross-cultural missionaries. Okay. So I want to explain there a challenge that we face. I even saw it today in an interview with one of the top leaders of Hamas with the Times Radio in London. The interviewer from Britain was saying, Will you acknowledge that you killed civilians? And the guy from Hamas refused to acknowledge that and started talking about why this was the right thing to do. We needed to do this. You know, we're, we're trying to restore the honor of the Muslim peoples. And so they never could connect because the, the guy from London kept saying, will you acknowledge this? And the guy from Hamas kept talking about history and, and honor and shame. Right. And so, we have to understand what's happening because there's a major cultural disconnect. In the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, 
they injected three dynamics in the world that did not exist before then, guilt, fear, and shame. And if you look at the Genesis account, you'll see all three of those. Every culture on earth is trying to deal with these three issues. They're the three largest issues that every culture on earth society is trying to deal with. However, none of them do it holistically because we're all fallen. Each culture has a main focus on just one of these issues rather than all three, okay, of guilt, fear, and shame. The West, we focus on guilt, right? Uh, because the law was given to the Jews, right? And that influenced the rest of Christianity where law, justice, law, guilt, justice based. And so the, th the, the West tends to, our religions tend to deal with the guilt issue and we don't really look at the others. And that's Judaism, Christianity, humanistic psychology, okay? Um, and we're focused on guilt and innocence, just like that guy at the Times Radio is trying to get the Hamas leader to say they're guilty. And these cultures tend to be individualistic and justice or forgiveness are the two ways to rectify what's wrong. Justice, you know, or for, yeah, or forgiveness. The South, Southern Hemisphere is focused on fear, you know, all those religions, um, animism, spiritism, voodoo, you know, they're afraid of the gods in the volcano that will destroy them or the gods in the jungle, et cetera. So they're focused on fear. I see this even when I would go to Brazil, you know, and preach in big churches. This about 10 years ago is still happening. I don't know about today, but people would bring up the keys to their car and things like that to ask you to pray over them because they were afraid their car was going to get stolen. So they focus on fear. Um, and that's a fear power based uh, ideology. They tend to be tribal you know, in those religions. Here's Islam. The East focuses on the shame issue of Islam, Confucianism, Buddhism. They're not focused on guilt or innocence. They So that's why the Hamas leader could not, did not acknowledge what they did. He was not even connecting any guilt in there. He's thinking about shame, right? So Islam is a shame and honor-based religion. They tend to be collectivist, okay? Here's the thing, the atonement of Christ, the only answer for this, therefore the only answer for the Muslim world is the atonement of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross dealt with all three issues. As a result, Christianity is the only holistic religion in the world. However, we don't often deal with it holistically. We're still culturally bound into the guilt, fear, or shame, you know, and we're still growing as Christians. So here are three scriptures that show where the atonement actually dealt with all three, okay? So um, I won't go into those scriptures. I just have a few minutes. I want to just explain a little bit more uh, of how this dynamic is affecting the current situation and why the only hope is to get Christians there who love them and who can be bridges for the gospel to go over. When my country, America, was going into Iraq back in 2003, I was horrified because I understood something my government didn't. Because there's a separation of church and state, high value in America, in the Pentagon and the White House, they don't often think of the power of religion or the power of culture. And actually, culture and religion are the two most powerful forces in the world and hardest, hardest to change. Excuse me. So in Iraq, I knew this, you have two things, three things. You have the Shia uh, in the Southeast, you have the Sunnis in the Central West, and you have the Kurds in the Northeast. You've got two major branches of Islam, you know, the Shia, which are actually the majority of Iraq. Uh, they're ruled by the Sunnis, Saddam Hussein, who are the minority. And then you had this cultural, this other cultural branch of Islam, the Kurds, in the Northeast who were Sunni as well. Um, so you had the Sunni-Shia split happening, but also um, with the Kurds and the Sunnis, you had a split because the Kurds are an Iranian people group. The Sunnis in Iraq were not. So you had both the Sunni-Shia split and three major cultures that Saddam was suppressing. 
because America ignored that and went in it unleashed all those dynamics. That's the current dynamic in Israel and Palestine is the Palestinians feel in a large part, and I'm not justifying actions on either part. I'm explaining it. They feel we're shamed. They shamed us. In fact, when Osama bin Laden acknowledged that they were involved in 9-11, he said it was to restore, to undo the shame of 80 years ago. That was the end of World War I when France and Britain carved up the Ummah, the, the Ottoman Empire, the nation of Islam, carved it up into Iraq, you know, Saudi Arabia. And so they felt shamed. And the way they restore honor is by like you would punch a bully, right? You restore your honor if you're bullied by violence. And so um, the Palestinians feel like the way to restore their honor and get dignity is, you know, exert some violence. The Israelis who are guilt and innocent culture, not understanding the shame honor, go, they broke international law and go in and bulldoze buildings. And the Palestinians go, they've shamed us again. We must restore our honor. So you have a total cultural missing of each other, just like the Hamas leader in the London Times interviewer this morning. So there's only one way to fix this, you guys. And I'm speaking in generalities. This is a generality. The only way to fix this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must plant Christians in the Muslim world amongst these 1.6 billion Muslims so they can be a bridge for the gospel to go across in a natural, organic way to win Muslims to Christ, teach them about Christ's death on the cross, which, which dealt with all three of these issues. So this is the overall picture. We need 200,000 brand new missionaries, basically, for the Muslim world if we're going to impact the Muslim world like we need to in this critical hour. So that's my prayer. It's what I'm living for right now. And I'm going to pass this back to you, Michael. Mr. Fred, thank you so much. It was so enlightening to see this perspective and to be able to understand the differences in the culture and the religious effect on it. I was trying to keep up with you and take notes. And uh, to be honest with you, I don't know if you'd be willing to share your PowerPoint, but if you would, I would love to be able to have that just to help us make some sense of that. I mean, it was it was absolutely incredible. So at this time, we're going to have James Lockett share with us. And uh, based out of Arizona there, and James has had a lot of influence and in, um, work in Israel and he's going to um, speak and address some of what is going on in our mind and how to interpret these things going on. So, James, if you would take it away, my friend. All right. Very good. Can you hear me? Yep. We're good. Okay. So it's great to address you again. I've been on here a few times with uh, uh, Elijah Lowe and Fred Market and spoken up a few times, but uh, my name is uh, James Lockett, and um, my background professionally is an international lawyer. I've lived about half my adult life in Europe and half in Asia. <clears throat> but for today's purposes, uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of roles that I had. And it, it'll be somewhat anecdotally, and I think it fits in really well with what Fred has just shared. But uh, uh, I, uh, I was one of the founders of the International Christian Chamber of Commerce in 1985 with Gunnar Olson. Many of you may have heard of, of, uh, of Gunnar. One of the first things that we did was sponsor a, a major prophetic conference in Israel in 1986. Now you know why my uh, hair is, uh, my head is shiny. Um, it's been a while. But uh, uh, we, we, uh, they brought together 50 prophets and one of them, was that who was asked was Gunnar Olson, and he went along. And uh, I was a young, 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 very young lawyer, actually, in my se second year of legal practice. But I found myself as an intercessor at this gathering of about 150 people on Mount Carmel. And uh, we spent a ten, about 10 days all together in Israel. So that that's an early foundation, but also an extremely prophetic, word-oriented. So I've been immersed in this whole dynamic of what we've been praying about for many years. Uh, fast forward a few years, we uh, then also the ICCC, as it's called, uh, supported a major, what was called Op Operation Exodus, was a major airlift of 
missing Jews, primarily from the former Soviet Union. But uh, we also, I was on the tarmac at Ben Gurion Airport in 1991 uh, with some of the leaders welcoming a, a an airplane load of Ethiopian Jews that we had brought home um, and um, weeping on the on the ground as they stepped down and 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 bowed in Thanksgiving to be finally home. Um, a year later, we had a major matchmaking conference in Jerusalem, matchmaking between Christian businesses and Jewish businesses. Uh, and, uh, and and connecting things. And uh, my matchmaking that came out of that was I, I ended up uh, becoming a legal representative of the Israeli government. And uh, so for the following four years, I, this time I was based in Brussels, Belgium. For the following four years, I represented the Israeli Ministry of Trade and helped them with international trade relations. And I also represented them in Brussels uh, in with through the uh, the embassy in Brussels, and it was a strange time because uh, many of you who know Jewish culture and 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 Jewish, the Jewish uh, Israel, uh, you'll know it's very unusual for the uh, Israel to hire any non-Jewish lawyers. In fact, as far as I know, I was the only. Uh, non-Jewish lawyer that represented the Israeli government anywhere at the time. I, this has probably changed since then. But uh, you learn a lot when you stand in the shoes of somebody. And uh, so that's that's been an interesting experience. And um, we could talk more about that. But I want to shift. Uh, it's interesting, there, those, those four years. But uh, fast forward a few years later, I was working in Washington, D.C., and uh, for the U.S. government at the time, and they asked me to lead up a team to go to the largest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia. And in fact, I did the same thing. I represented the uh, Indonesian Ministry of Trade for four years, embedded uh, in, in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. So I've had four years with Israel and four years with Indonesia. And you learn a lot in the, in the shoes of that dynamic. Um, so uh, some other things that I've seen during this time, um, we uh, we also had a conference in Moscow, Russia, and, and again, something that Fred touched on. Uh, but it's interesting to, to see how people perceive that. We had the fortune of, uh, of having the deputy foreign minister of the Soviet Union at the time come and open our conference that we were sharing with him. His name is Viktor Karpov. Uh, if you're a historian, probably Fred has read about this. I don't know if anybody else has, but Viktor Karpov was the Russian representative in the, uh, uh, the, the, the missile negotiations, STAR and START, those treaty uh, reductions. Um, and he completely did not understand the Middle East. I mean, uh, like dumb, absolutely dumb. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's the same thing that we see as we look as Christians with spiritual eyes and understanding, uh, it's shocking to see it on a global level, but but it, it, it does exist. People simply cannot understand the impact of th those different ways of thinking, those mindsets. Uh, they don't have a clue about the principalities and powers uh, behind that as well. But uh, we spent about two hours educating him on how to properly uh, assess the Middle East, and it was quite funny. I'm still a young lawyer at that stage and teaching uh, what was probably the two, second most experienced Soviet diplomat, someone who had served in that capacity for more than 30 years. Um, but uh, uh, I, 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 I'll fo focus a little bit more on the Indone experience in Indonesia. This was in the last 20 years. So this started in about 2005. And so I'm four years in the Indonesian Ministry of Trade. And so you get to see their, their different festivals. Uh, uh, of course, in Ramadan, they would start to fast. So I decided, all right, well, I, I can fast too. Um, and so I would fast with them. And I, they, they thought, wow, why would you fast? Well, I'm, I, I, I want to be close to God. And, uh, uh, and actually, I, I told them, with all due respect, I find your fast easy. Because you just have to uh, not eat uh, between dusk and 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 sunset, and uh, I've done longer fasts than that, you know. And 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 uh, 
I don't get a break at night. So they have a, they have a break to basically feast uh, every, every evening. Uh, but you can um, you can sort of see that as they celebrate Edel Fitri, uh, the holiday of breaking the fast also. And that's a th big three-day party that they have at the end of Ramadan, uh, Edel Fitri. And they were astonished that someone would fast and then understand a lot of that. Um, and uh, you also see something a little bit more odd and strange, and that's uh, not the Eid al-Fitri, but uh, they have something called the Feast of Sacrifice, uh, Eid al-Adha. And that commemorates what Fred mentioned as well, Abraham, Ibrahim, sacrificing his son Ishmael, not Isaac, obviously. And you can watch the Muslims sacrifice. And I had uh, a relationship with a family that was very close to uh, the previous ruling family of uh, of uh, Indonesia, this uh, 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 Sukarno uh, and Suharto, uh, but this was the Suharto family. And um, I would get invited to their private feast that they would do during the, uh, the, uh, the, the Feast of Sacrifice. And uh, they had money, so they would actually get two, two cows and you would see, you know, 50 or 100 people at this party dancing and celebrating as and and you'd watch the cows getting more and more nervous and they can see what's going on and then they're tying them up and slitting the cows throats and they're dancing and singing it's a it's an astonishing thing to watch as comparison to what we experienced uh, uh with with uh with everything that we know in christianity uh, so you 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 also learn some things so muslims as pious as they may be, and they're more pious often than us Christians. They pray five times a day, salat. They do their salat. Uh, and so they appear to be praying, but they're really just reciting things, and they're not actually engaging with God uh, in the same way. They don't experience love from God. They don't experience forgiveness from God. They can talk about it, but most of their ways to receive forgiveness or love are by doing by performing, not by receiving. And it's a it's a profound, massive difference. And I'm not going to delve into the principalities and powers and everything else that we know about that. But um, uh, I, 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 I think as Fred was saying, you know, we need supernatural love. Uh, we need supernatural levels of holiness. They also, uh, I, I could see, they respect someone who is more holy than them, uh, and they, they don't understand what holiness means really from a Christian standpoint, but they can see someone who operates in righteousness and it kind of astonishes them because they're taught to think that all the infidels are lower than them. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving a lot of anecdotal things. I, I'm, I'm uh, also very uh, impressed because I think, you know, some of you will probably want to talk about uh, the current conflict in in Israel as well, um, and um, you know one of the big issues. Speaking of the differences in thinking, is the uh, the uh, M Muslim and the Arab world respect strength, and that was another one of the themes that Fred was talking about. And at some point, you know, we're going to have to address this issue of 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 strength and power that the Israelis are going to exert. Now, there's there's a lot of scriptures in there. I don't want to get into, you know, uh, sort of eschatological kinds of things, but um, there uh, there are some of those issues uh, to address. And you know, I think um, you know there's there there are some people that want to talk about the proportionality of Israel's response that we'll see. Um, and Israel struggled with that before. Uh, we know that with the Amalekites, uh, they they were told to strike super strong, in fact, to exterminate them. We know that from Exodus and the victory of the Amalekites. Uh, and the Lord, the Lord says the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, Amalek as a people kind of disappeared about 400 B.C., so they're not there. But there are, you know, arguably, I think we could discuss that or not, <laughs> principalities and powers. Anyway, there's... There's, there's something behind the dynamic there that Israel needs to deal strongly with, I would argue, and I think I think many could agree. Uh, but uh, now, now 
And I think this is also behind what you're hearing from Israel, that they want to utterly destroy Hamas. Uh, and, and they feel that that's one of the forces behind it. So there's a lot of things. There is a better approach in terms of fighting against the principalities and powers. Um, Israel is battling against some of that. We're battling against some of that. And we know that there are those principalities and powers. And to win, of course, Ephesians 9, 18 and uh, 18, 19, we have to pray in the spirit with all kinds of prayers and requests and let those be named known to God. So I, I'm going to stop there. I'm, I'm, it's actually a little bit early, but I think I want to move things along. Uh, so I'll pass over to to anyone. Uh, and I, I I trust that that some of those distinctions have been helpful for us this morning in in seeing things. And again, uh, I was just earlier this morning, uh, actually it's three o'clock in the morning for me because uh, I'm on the Pacific time zone, uh, spending two hours uh, with a, a live Zoom from Jerusalem. Uh, with someone from the 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 uh, 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 Jerusalem prayer breakfast, uh, a, a former advisor to uh, one of the prime ministers, and uh, a top lawyer representing 300 organizations uh, helping the families. So I'm tuned into some of that side too. If we want to explore some of that, so back to you, Michael. Thank you so much. Bless you. All right. Thank you, James, and appreciate the perspective and what you've done. And um, guys, the whole part of all of this is painting a picture that us in a Western culture and with our theological background, we might not completely understand this. So this is quite eye-opening. So I want to make time for Leif Hetland, who God has supernaturally um, positioned to be an ambassador, they, um, an ambassador of love to the Islamic nations. And he goes in and um, what Fred talked about of positioning Christians to live their lives in the midst of Islam. And um, and Leif has been placed in the middle of this. And so Leif, if you would take it away. And I'm excited to hear from your perspective what God is doing among the Muslim people. All right, you're muted, sir. Uh, first of all, I wanted to send love and greetings from uh, Virginia. I'm in my hotel room, and uh, I was just thinking about uh, last night, my friend Heidi Baker was actually sharing, and we had several thousand people on the floor just receiving a fresh baptism of love, and she was in Israel. And uh, when this was happening on October 7th, and we had a team inside Israel, but also lived in northern Mozambique, where as many of you are familiar with the Book of Haram, that a lot of the things, excuse me, Al-Shabaab, but the very thing that we are seeing taking place in Israel is something that we have experienced for quite a few years. So I just want to put that into perspective of, I think it is so easy in this season to be distracted by what God is not doing because we don't see what God is doing. And especially giving attention to what the enemy is doing. And right now, it's not that we do not grieve or weep with the ones that are weeping. But I thought about sharing a little bit of my story and my testimony uh, that led up to this. Uh, some of you can hear that I have an accent. And uh, the reason is I'm from the country of Norway. Uh, I do live in Atlanta. But my story is I was a Baptist pastor, actually more conser conservative, reformed. Uh, some of the Southern Baptists, they want me to go back to Norway and pastor there with the purpose of mainly seeing the Norwegian being more conservative in regard to the theology. But during this uh, time period, uh, something started happening. We had lost a couple of people uh, to cancer in my Baptist church and led to a painful experience where I knew there had to be something more uh, than I experienced with God. And I heard about something going on in Toronto in 94 and started to open up. And June 6, 1995, a man named Randy Clark, who I'm with here right now, actually, uh, but Randy Clark came to this little place in Norway. That was June 6, 1995. And Randy just started to share some stories and about his own transformation. But he came in humility and vulnerability. And because of his own brokenness, I could relate to it. If he had just talked about successes, I don't know if I could. But when he then invited, if you're hungry for something more, and I was so overwhelmed, and whatever overwhelms you will shake you. And I was not just overwhelmed by love or overwhelmed by Jesus, but there was other things that overwhelmed me. So I stood in line there with the Assembly of God and Salvation Army and the Lutherans. We all stood in a little line for impartation. This was the leadership meeting before uh, they had an open meeting in the evening and more renewal service. To make that story short, 
what Randy went down, touch him, bless him, fill him. And I was kind of a little nervous because people went on the floor, uh, something we didn't do in my Baptist church. And so I kind of tightened a little bit my legs. And by the time he got to me, he didn't say more, Lord, but he says, you are a bulldozer. And I'm thinking, no, I'm a Baptist pastor. I didn't know much about prophecy, but he said, you're going to be a bulldozer going into the darkest places in the world where the gospel has never been before. And this big light is following after you. And then the next moment, I'm on the floor shaking electricity, fire, electricity and fire. And for over two hours, this Norwegian Baptist pastor, this Viking, just had a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. And I came up from there and I didn't know while I was on the floor, I thought I heard a whisper. You're going to see over a million Muslims meeting Jesus. And I didn't know one Muslim. But two weeks later, I'm in uh, actually a guy from, called Peter Helms that maybe Fred will know. And I've had the honor of walking with Fred for the last 12 years as we've been part of a mastermind group. But anyway, uh, so uh, a guy uh, with youth with a mission, I was translating for him in, in a little place in Norway. And he said, you are a bulldozer. His name was Peter Helms from Holland. And you're going to go into the darkest area where the gospel has not been before. And a million Muslims is going to meet Jesus because of you. And I was wrecked. And that started a journey. Make the story short, six months later, I'm in the Middle East and a meeting and eventually uh, started for the first time to see power evangelism. Uh, we had a quarter polity. I thought it was seven radicals that wanted to kill me. Instead, they were shouting because they had carried a friend on a stretcher and he was quarter polygic. And then the presence of Jesus had touched him in the meeting and they were shouting and they gave their life to Jesus. And after that, I was changed because from that moment on, I realized and there was something that greater, that we didn't have a darkness problem in the world, but lack of light. We didn't have a fear problem, but lack of love, because perfect love always casts out fear. So it started, and that was in December of 95. I went through a process now, make the story short, broken neck, later on broken back, body cast, went through a lot of, and in 1999, I didn't know how to do anything any longer. And this led to a picture where I'm in a wheelchair in this new world and broken, and I had been to 54 countries, seen a half a million people saved, 300,000 healings. But on the inside, I was an orphan. And I was living for love instead of from love. And I've been all over the Muslim world, and especially in Pakistan, Afghanistan, different places. But in that season, as I'm saying, uh, I had an encounter with the Father's love. It was December, a man named Jack Taylor, who I later got to call spiritual father. And for the next 22 years, every single day, talking to him, doing life together, learning how to be a son, son of Papa God. But that's when I realized the cry of Ishmael. Before Islam was a problem, now it became a promise. And my par paradigm shifted in that moment. And I just thought about showing it. I know we have a very short time here, but I wanted to show a couple of pictures because it's kind of connected to my story. But after my baptism of love, and I call it, it's kind of a Jesus. I had an audible voice after this liquid love for over two hours came over me in Melbourne, Florida. And there was an audible voice from heaven that says, Live, you are my, and you're my beloved. You're my beloved son, whom I love and whom I am well pleased. This was a couple of months ago in Kashmir. We just arrived. I was going to have a meeting with the president of Kashmir, as well as we brought in 40 different streams of Islam together in this meeting. I'm just going to show a couple of highlights. I was going to show a video, but I knew that video would be a little bit too inflamed if it went online. So some of these pictures is already public from the Muslim side, so I was not that afraid. The next picture is in a private meeting, actually, with the president of Kashmir, and we're just giving... Uh, my giant slayers book to him. And then just here's the next picture. This is Dr. Hussein. And the next picture, he's one. Uh, you know, this is actually, they gave me an award, the president. And this is the granny mom of the, the King's Mosque, the Bachai Mosque. Uh, and then here is another picture just with uh, Dr. Hussein, who is a Shia, one of my Shia friends. We've been friends for 23 years, since 2000. And he's both part of the Islamic Ideology Council and is the top Shia clergy. Uh, in Pakistan and very closely connected with Iran. So even this morning, I was thinking about, I have 10 texts and five of them are from the Shia side and, and the other side on the Sunni side, just on my WhatsApp of different leaders. But Fred just mentioned to build relationship and trust. The next picture is also a little interesting because eight years earlier, it's kind of a, what do you see? I only see dead bones. It was a place where women uh, didn't have any voice. They didn't go to school. And here I was just also recently and they just welcomed me and we cut the ribbon and all these Muslim girls was talking about dreaming again and dreaming with God. And they said, before eight years ago, we only saw black and white. Now we see color everywhere. 
And I just love that testimony. And one more little slide, uh, and then I'm just going to share a couple of things. This is with the president of Pakistan uh, two years ago, and it was a significant thing. He is to the right of me when I'm looking at the screen and with a lot of government leaders and both Sunni Shia and other Muslim leaders. We had some other leaders from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, uh, Qatar, and, and other parts of the Arab world. But that's also when the president gave me a award, uh, an honor. It was an international peace award as an ambassador of love. And I'm not saying that from a braggers, but it's more just my process of learning to be a son and learning how to serve and learning the language of love that I believe is the language the blind eyes can see and the deaf ears can hear. So if I could go back to the screen there, Mike, and just sharing, if I can get about five, six more minutes uh, to talk a little bit of what I feel uh, God has put in my heart, but I felt specifically now for 28 years, it's been, I'm not saying it's been easy. I have a lot of scars underneath these fancy clothes and we have lost a lot of lives. Uh, I have been everything sitting down with Boko Haram to meeting people that are, and I met with the victims, including some of those girls. We went up to, uh, um, when we were in like Nigeria uh, and met with some of the girls that was originally kidnapped and was doing trauma, had several doctors with us and ministered to them uh, when Boko Haram relieved them. And what to see the work of Al-Shabaab uh, in 2000 was my first time I got into an Al-Qaeda training camp. So there was a year before and met Al-Qaeda or I was just in a meeting with some of the Taliban. So over the years I met on the Hamas side, Hezbollah, different groups over the world, more in a relational element. And I don't know why God has allowed me to, to win the hearts. Mainly, I think it is love. I say you have authority where you weep, when we get broken over what is broken. But we also have authority where we love. And I remember my friend Heidi, because I'm also on the board there, uh, when she called me because of the horrific similar images, the worst images we hear from Israel happened to some of our people and pastors and the beheadings and other things. And it was just so hard. And God, that she just needed, she said, I don't know how to love these people. And I'm not talking about love that what they do is evil. It's demonic. It is terrorism. But just loving those people. And as soon as she had an encounter, she said, I don't know how to. And he said, can I give you that love? And when she received that love, God opened up her prison where she got to going into it, the Al-Shabaab. And many of them experienced Jesus, met Jesus, had an encounter with Jesus. So, But they're still in prison and they're supposed to be in prison. So I'm putting that into perspective for somebody that want to make sure there is justice. So my angle, like I think coming more from the angle that Fred was describing of relationship, uh, I've been at the weddings, I've been the best man, spoken at the King's Mosque, Bacchahai's Mosque, as a, as, as a Christian, uh, Professor Sharia Law, including James mentioned Indonesia, uh, where we're doing debates in Islamic University, where they are talking about Sharia. And they say, hey, what do you want to talk about? Well, instead of the love of law, let us talk about the law of love. And each one of us have a topic, but then to be able to release love call it impartation in all language. Sometimes it's called covert revival. Underneath the radar, people have encounters, and then they start to talk about it. And then I thought about one picture I got this last week, uh, because for me, love is in the center. And then from that place, power and wisdom has to flow from that place. And that means in the next moment, uh, some of the greatest relationship I've had has been some of the greatest enemies. One of them tried to kill me for five years and said I blasphemed Muhammad. And it was a horrific ordeal. And I realized he was not the problem. I was the problem. And I remember when I started to weep in behalf of him because I was seeing the terrorist Saul instead of seeing the Apostle Paul. And I didn't treat him based upon his destiny, but his history. And later on, God gave me another opportunity to meet him. And he had broken his arm in an official meeting. And as we came into the meeting, I just felt the Holy Spirit say, just go over and touch his arm. And as I touched his arm, <laughs> The bone came and I couldn't even touch him because in the previous meeting we had in an official the government meeting, he had shook my hand and I heard he went and cleaned his hand because he had touched an infidel, a, a unclean person. And today he's one of my closest friends. He puts his arm around me. Uh, I could have shown the video earlier, but you would see him kissing and hugging me, welcoming me. I'm sharing in the mosque, uh, also releasing healing in the mosque. So I'm just from my perspective that i know that sometimes it is not the angle that we get to hear and i'm talking about from saudi officials iranians from not just official but also people on the 
on, on a level that in a sense that are the poor, that are the broken. Uh, so I, I feel it, I, I don't want to just go in in the sense of the governmental or religious leaders. But for me, that I need another fresh baptism of love. I've been broken since everything happened in Israel and I have seen evil. I've experienced evil. We have lost a lot of life with evil. And my last trip, some of you know that two days after I came home, they burned down the Christian homes and uh, Jerawala as well as, and 12 of our churches was burned down. So uh, over these 28 years of learning the language of love, but I'm not learning it, but I'm practicing the language of love. I've seen the blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've been in rooms with 400 radicals and see the atmosphere changing. I've stood there with a guns in my mouth and the next moment tears comes in and people are having an encounter with a God that looks like Jesus. So my simple, I want everyone in the world, every Muslim, every Hindu, every Buddhist, but I want everyone to experience a God just like Jesus. And that's why I think what Fred mentioned so beautifully, that 85% of them have never had somebody, they never met somebody that represent a God that looks like Jesus. And for me, Jesus is perfect theology. He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And I believe the biggest cry of Islam is actually fatherlessness and father deficiency. So Ishmael was rejected by his father. So the root of even the whole religion is fatherlessness and father deficiency. So the cry of Ishmael is uh, God cannot be a father and he cannot have a son. And that orphan heart and the orphan spirit, the biggest thing if we're buying into fear and allowing fear to be the response back again, because I know Esau married into Ishmael's family. And Esau, that spirit with vengeance, you took my birthright, you took my blessing, now I'm coming after you. It's different than Ishmael who's in the wilderness looking for water. And as Hagar, as a woman came with water, I believe the church have an opportunity to come with living water. And then I also believe there is hope for Esau. I have seen terrorists. I've seen the people that has been my vengeance. I have seen a little bit too much to not be overwhelmed by what God is doing and the goodness and kindness of God that can lead to repentance. So that's just a little bit of my own. I do not have the chance to go into any teaching here, but a little of my testimony. I'm learning to love. It's been 28 years, and I will continue to want to learn the language of love, which I believe is better than English, Norwegian, Arabic, Urdu. And that's what they even in the mosque wants me to talk about. They said, could you again talk about love? And to be called the ambassador of love, that's what the president of Kashmir president of Pakistan, when the Taliban just invited me and I was just in a meeting with top Taliban leaders, when I came in, oh, we have the ambassador of love here. And then I get to talk about the language of love. And of course, God is love. It's not something he does, it's something he is. And as he is, so are we in this world. So God bless you. And thank you for the few moments I got to share with you. And Leif, thank you so much for sharing the heart of God for both the Jew and for the Arab. And this is what we have to pray. And so um, for James, for um, Mr. Fred, for Leif, is there anything else you guys want to share before we go into a prayer time? Anything you felt like, man, I really need to, to say this? Anything, gentlemen? I just want to highlight again, God is doing amazing things in the Muslim world and every place where there are Christians that's where Muslims come to know Christ. So what James did by living in Indonesia and living a lifestyle of Christianity, Leif, I've known Leif 12 years. It seems, it seems longer than that, Leif. You know, Leif is a great example. When we just go and relate, we become bridges for the gospel. You know, so there's no getting around Christians going into the Muslim world and living the life of Christ in their midst. That's the way we're going to stop terrorism. Bullets will stop a heart. There's no, there's no military solution to what's happening in the Middle East right now. Bullets stop hearts. Only Jesus changes a heart and heals this misconnection between the guilt, fear, and shame culture. So um, missions is the only answer. Amen. Amen. Could I also just mention one more thing uh, that I just felt when Fred was sharing? For me, if we're talking about the missionaries, uh, 
And for me, it's so important that the identity in Jesus, there is a lamb and there is a lion. He is the lamb of God, but he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I want to encourage us, especially in this season, do not underestimate the power of the lamb. So if you look at about in the book of Revelation, at least over 24 times the lamb is mentioned and one time the lion. And so I think that if the identity is in the lamb, then the authority is in the lion. But when we roar, people will gather and not scatter because it comes from the lamb's heart. So when we see Barabbas, let me take his place. I know what he deserved, but I take his place. The lamb's nature of Jesus, don't underestimate. They are not too afraid of my lion. And we can roar against each other as long as you want to. But sometimes they don't know what to do with a lamb. So... Jesus, the lamb, and that's what Palm Sunday shifted. They wanted a line, the Roman culture and what was happening. But Jesus, he showed up as a lamb. So I'm just encouraging us as we are beholding the lamb, the lamb, the lamb of Jesus. Yeah. And even what we are beholding, we are becoming, and what we become is what we release. Amen. Oh, I want to highlight what James did by being in Indonesia, right? We think of missionaries as just those who've been trained like me and YWAM, you know, working with the unreached for 50 years. But James, I considered him a missionary when he was in Indonesia because he was the bridge for the gospel through his relationships. He had the kingdom of God is within us. He carried a deposit of the kingdom with him into Indonesia and became a bridge for the gospel. So missionaries now, after post-COVID, are going to have to look more like James, who are going into those parts of the world with their skills and talents and being a bridge for the gospel. And if I can take one minute to just explain a little bit more, you guys, I want to tell you so you can be preparing your people. You know, it seems we get a 20-year break in between seasons, 20 to 25-year break between seasons of terrorism, Okay. So just go back a few cycles, you know, to the 70s, right, of all the airline uh, hijackings, the Munich Olympics, et cetera, that ended with Reagan. So from 80s and 90s, we had a break. Then we had 9-11. Okay, then we've had a break for about 20 years. This is, I believe, the beginning of a brand new season of terrorism. We need to be preparing people to be... Um, ready because about every 20 to 25 we get a 20 to 25 year break between these seasons of terrorism um second our big challenge right now lebanon our dear brother from lebanon and lebanon you know it's 45 to 55 percent shia and you know and so there's a shia sunni mix and christians in lebanon um because of the shia uh, Hezbollah is totally in the pocket of Iran, doing what Iran wants. You guys have to realize Hamas is Sunni, so it's a weird connection for Sunnis to be fun, you know, to be in the pocket of Iran like Hamas is. But that's a marriage of convenience only. Okay, um, it is not. Uh, can I share my screen one more time, Michael? And I'll be done real quick. Yes, sir. You're um, still in Go ahead. Oh, for some reason, it's not showing me I can share. What's wrong? Oh, I see. Never mind. Um, so you see that. So what's really happening there? Um, uh, Saudi Arabia is shunning the West and is making peace with Iran, right? So this is major to have this, a Sunni and Shia country making peace, especially in this situation with Hamas in Israel, Saudi Arabia is clearly um, saying we want to get closer to Iran through this. So we've we haven't seen this kind of peace between the Sunnis and Shia capitals, Saudi Arabia and Iran, in 1400 years. This is significant. It's because Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia is not religiously driven. He just wants Saudi Arabia to develop, and he's pragmatic, and he's saying. Um, okay, I'm going to work with Iran instead of fighting Iran. Okay, so in this map, you can see the, the gray is Sunni, the green is Shia, right? So Hamas is Sunni, but it's just a marriage of convenience. Iran is using them for its purposes. Okay, and here's why Saudi Arabia is making peace with Iran. A Bedouin Arab proverb, I against my brother. That's Sunni in Iran, uh, that's Saudi Arabia, Iran. I against my brother, against my cousin, right? 
I, my brother and my cousin against the world. So it's a major shift for Saudi Arabia and Iran to be cooperating. Uh, two books I want to highly recommend, very easy reading. One is called The 3D Gospel that, sh that will give you an overview of the gear, fear, guilt, shame dynamic. Um, of course, in missiology, we go into greater depth, but this is a primer on that. And another book called Foreign to Familiar, which explains the difference between warm climate cultures and cold climate cultures, right? And so understanding these two differences uh, is critical to understanding the world and to, especially for people like James and others who will go into the Muslim world uh, using their skills and be bridges for the gospel. You know, we need to, uh, I, I believe more and more the whole church needs to understand these dynamics as the world intermixes more and immigration uh, uh, increases. So what you're seeing with Hamas, I believe Iran's not ready uh, to, to go into, um, to really engage uh, and Hamas right now is a marriage of convenience of Hezbollah started to really up the ante by attacking Israel. You know, Iran is saying we're serious. We're going after Israel. But Hezbollah is holding back now. They're really, you know, in their Shia. And so anyway, just trying to explain the situation. The only answer is Christ Jesus really is. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, thank you, Fred, for sharing these books and giving us a picture of this. And the three of you together, thank you for sharing, um, you know, how we can interpret the things we're seeing in a more accurate way. And so the last thing before we go into prayer time, I want to ask Pastor Kavork, Pastor Kavork, with you being in Lebanon and with Hezbollah attacking Israel from Lebanon, is there any updates you would like to give us before we go into prayer? Um, I know the team is praying about coming to you in a couple of weeks. And um, is there anything that you would like to say to provide perspective in this? I think his Zoom has frozen up. There you go, Pastor Kavor. Go ahead, sir. There and hear you well because I'm having problem with my internet. You said something, you asked something. Okay. I didn't yes, know. I was just asking if there's any perspective you would like to provide being in Lebanon and from, you know, Hezbollah attacking Israel from Lebanon, just anything for us to pray about, anything we need to understand in that situation to be able to pray accurately and to handle this. I agree 100% with what Fred and Leif and the others were saying. I think we need to pray and act like Christians because all the other things are uh, things that doesn't concern us, actually, because it is forced, imposed on us. Yeah. So prayers and declarations, I think, will be the best. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Well, Pastor Gort, thank you for your faithfulness there and the way you shepherd, the way you lead. And and uh, we're praying for God to do the work he has promised over Lebanon as well through this whole entire situation. So how I wanted to end this, I wanted to ask Leif, if he would, to begin the prayer time and then ask a few of you leaders to uh, pray afterward and then we'll wrap up. And, um, and we've heard the perspective. And so let's just go to the Lord because apart from him moving, we have no hope in this. So uh, my brother Leif, if you would, please go ahead and begin this. Sure. Father, we just wanted to bring glory to the name of Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you are still the Prince of Shalom. Stay sound, complete, and whole in every area of life. And I'm just asking, Father, first of all, forgiveness in behalf of some of our hearts, including my heart, where so many different times we're just being so overwhelmed by what is happening in darkness that we have forgotten about turning on the light. And you remind us to arise and shine, for your light has come. And yes, there is a diagnosis what's going to happen with the darkness, but in the middle of it, you have called us to be the light of the world. 
And I thank you, Jesus, you are still the light of the world and that light is still stronger than darkness. Father, I want to ask specifically supernatural protection and supernatural peace to be upon our family board in Lebanon, also over the believers in Palestine and be with also our family in Israel. Father, just even ask now for a spirit of wisdom and revelation. But in the middle of this darkness, I just ask again that uh, just bring glory to yourself, Jesus. Mm. And I just ask that we're going to see in the middle of the tragedy what the enemy meant for evil, for God to be able to use this for good. And it's going to give an opportunity for the church worldwide to come together in unity and in love and to start to minister both to Palestinians as well as Israeli and to anyone in the Middle East with such an extravagant generosity goodness and kindness and love that's going to need is going to lead to a major major repentance so father i thank you that the goodness and the kindness still lead to repentance so i'm just asking right now come holy spirit we need you holy spirit you are a holy holy spirit and the holy spirit whom the father has given in my name he will teach you all things and he will remind you of everything that i've told you so father just ask that first of all in the middle of the storm as jesus barred his pillow and we do have a physical storm we do have an emotional storm and we have a spiritual storm where are you jesus in the middle of it that you jesus were right there and you were resting on a pillow so father Teach us about the hard work of rest. So rest also will be our weapon of warfare so that we, even in the middle of that resting place, can become a resting place for the Holy Spirit where the dove can rest. And from that very place that we will minister because we can see your face, hear your voice, feel, and we do what we see our Father do and we say what we hear the Father say. So I'm just asking right now, shut down any other voice in this season so that we can still hear the voice of Father God. So come, Holy Spirit, now for each one of us in the middle of some of the internal storms that we have, that even if we carry both shame, fear, or guilt on the inside, that you would just do a surge in our life, just as even last night you reminded me that I just, you need to go deeper with a knife and do a deeper surgery and just allowing these things to come out of us because we cannot deal with the giants that are on the outside when we have giants on the inside. So just overwhelm us so much with you that nothing else can overwhelm us. Let us not see how big the giants are in the land, but help us to get the proper perspective and see how big you are. Give us that Joshua and Caleb spirit that even as we are looking at what seems impossible, that in the middle of all we can see opportunity and we can see how big you are. So let us look up before we look in so that we can look out, then we can look forward. So just give us the eyes of love, the eyes of love, so we can see into the invisible and then be able to do the impossible. Fresh baptism of love over each one of us in this season and let that perfect love remove away fear in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Anybody else feel led to, to pray over this? Go ahead and start. Mm. Hallelujah. Lord, we, we thank you, Father, that you have made a way for Jew and Gentile. Lord, I pray, God, for your church everywhere in the earth at this hour, that, God, we will understand your vision for the new man, for the one new man. Lord mm -hmm. God, that there will be uh, such clarity of the gospel, Lord, such clarity of the work to make, Lord, neither Greek nor Jew, that, Lord, all will be one in Christ. Lord, we pray against the division in the Christian community, mm -hmm. that, God, people will not choose the sides of uh, politics, but that they will choose your side, your perspective. Lord, we pray, God, that we will be pure ambassadors of the love that you have shed abroad. Lord, like in the day of Pentecost, the Arabs heard the wonderful works of God through the, the diverse tongues. And God, in this hour, we pray, God, that there will be ears hearing the wonderful works of God mm -hmm. instead of the works of men. Yeah. Lord, pray for your church, that we would shed every human tradition, and Lord, that we would grab hold of your commandment to love our neighbor as ourself. Lord, we pray for wisdom for the church, Lord. We pray for wisdom, 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 Lord, mm -hmm. that God, we may be able to understand how to navigate in conversations and cultures and, and spiritual issues that we never once understood. 
Lord, we ask God that this lamb that that was spoken about that will that he will be seen that Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, shall be seen. Lord God, we pray that the gospel will go forth with such clarity, with such exactness, Lord, that whether they be Jewish or whether they would be Arab or Gentile, that they will both bow before the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask these things for your glory. Lord, I just contend for the message of the gospel at this hour, and my prayer is that Christ will be fully formed in Jew and Gentile, and that Christ will be represented purely through your church at this hour, Lord. We give you thanks for this. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. Lord, I would just like to pray as you commanded us to for people to go into the harvest. Lord, the harvest fields are white, ready to be harvested. And everywhere there are Christians in the Muslim world, Muslims are coming to know Christ, Lord. So I just pray for a release of new laborers to go into the spiritual descendants of Ishmael, Lord, that you promised to bless, Lord. And um, I ask for a new um, uh, th tens of thousands of James Lockett's who will use their gifts, talents, and abilities to go work in the Muslim world, be a bridge uh, for your gospel to incarnate the gospel. You love the world so much you sent your son. You had an incarnational answer for the world. God, so I just pray that you would raise up uh, Christians who will willingly go into the Muslim world using their gifts, talents, abilities, go in as uh, trained missionaries, go in and every is tourists, Lord, in every way possible, flood the Muslim world with your sons and daughters who love you, who know you, believers who will be bridges for your good news, Lord. So I'm asking you to re as the Lord of the harvest to release new laborers into the harvest field at this time. Re I rebuke in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. God, I ask you to rebuke fear in the heart of Christians yeah. who just would be afraid of approaching uh, the Muslim world. I have found most Muslims to be so full of love and, mm -hmm. and compassion and tenderness <laughs> and friendliness and open arms, God. So I just pray that you yeah. come against the spirit of fear in the church. Lord, I also pray, like my brother did too, that the church wouldn't get politicized by the Israeli-Palestinian situation right now, God. Everyone in that part of the world is an object of your redemption, yeah. Lord. And your church is about redemption. Government's about wielding the sword. But we're not about that, God. We're about redemption and sharing your love. God, so help your church in this hour have a love for Muslims, Lord, that there wouldn't be a worldly response of uh, on the part of Christians of retribution, God, but mm -hmm. our heart would be redemption, and we leave to the governments what they do uh, with the sword, Lord, to enforce international law or whatever. That's not our role. God, so I just pray in this season you'd implant a love for the Muslim world in the heart of believers around the world, that we can be bridges of your good news, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yes, Father, we give you praise and honor. Lord, mm. as, as an Arab Christian, mm. my heart thrilled and touched and overwhelmed today with what I heard. Mm. I've never heard Western people speak that way because you've showed me 9-11, Lord, you exposed Islam to the world. But during the spring, the Arab Spring, you exposed Islam to the Muslims. And they've been running out of Islam millions. But there was no way to go anywhere because the church was afraid of them and because of lack of love. And as I was walking the streets of Paris and seeing the North Africans, Muslims, with no sh shepherd to yeah. lead them, God, I thank you, Father, as it's so normal and natural for them to feel rejected because they believe naturally Ishmael is the firstborn. He has the right. He has the right for the land. He has the right for the promises. So they need their eyes open to know the spiritual 
that the blessing is on always been on the second birth and not the first birth. But without the love, the real love, because Lord, as I grew among them, lived among them, they could smell fear. And when they smell fear in your heart, in our hearts, they don't receive, they don't accept. So God, I thank you for the spoken today. As an Arab Christian right now, I cry, I cry out that this would mm. be grace, that this would be an eye opener, that we will all be baptized by the love of the Father so that we could be able to minister to the orphan spirits that in, in, in the Ishmael descendants and speak today, Lord, the word of love with, with authority, with meaning, with, with, with authenticity, not just Christianese words, oh God, because that is the only answer in the Middle East is the baptism of love that will cover that whole region. Uh, Orthodox, Catholics, uh, Baptists, uh, Evangelicals, Muslims, Jews, God, thank you for this time that we have spent together. I pray specifically, Lord, that we will make the right decision as I feel responsible because I'm taking this group to Lebanon to have the, the, the mind of Christ, uh, to know, Lord, what do we do? Do we continue with our trip? We need to know that as soon as possible because they are calling and they are waiting for decisions of God. All these wonderful pastors that are going to be gathering uh, to hear Bishop uh, on that day that we are there, God, and so many of them coming and some coming from outside Lebanon to come in there. God, we need your divine wisdom. And I pray it and I cover it to receive it, to know exactly that we don't want to go by the news or by the family's fears our relatives' fears. We want to hear your voice. Speak to us clarity in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Well, thank you for all gathering here. Thank you for Fred, James, and Leif. Thank you for sharing and opening our eyes to the proper perspective from the Father's heart, as well as, you know, to be able to interpret things correctly. Um, I want to end with this. A, a good friend of mine by the name of Stephen Curry, not the basketball player, but he is um, based in Palestine, in Bethlehem. He and his family, his father, Naeem Curry, they run Bethlehem Baptist Church, and he is um, he is on the grounds, and he is caught right in the middle between Israel and Gaza. And I had him on Zoom Sunday with our church. And he told us the same thing. He said, this is about the sons of Abraham, the Jews and the Arabs coming together and being restored to the family God wants them to have. And we have to pray for both. And so what Fred's passion was, was people boots on the ground, so to speak, in the midst of Islamic culture, bringing the light of the gospel to them. And I want to just ask you guys to pray for my friend, Stephen Curry and he is boots on the ground. He is awesome. He is right in the middle of that, um, the conflict between Palestine and between um, Israel. And pray for Pastor Kavork and our other Lebanese. Um, last year, we went to Naura and to Tyre, and we are right in the churches that are right on the edge of this conflict with Hezbollah and Israel. And God has put his people in the midst of this conflict, and his light will overcome darkness. And so I want us to remember we're part of a global church, not just our local church. We've got a big family of God. So as you pray, as you intercede, as you ask for the Father's heart, I ask you to remember our brothers and sisters who are in the midst of this, that God will strengthen them and that light will overcome darkness. And so Leif, James, and Fred, thank you again for sharing. And on behalf of Bishop Matera, just want to thank all of you for joining in. Please equip, if you're pastors, if you're parachurch ministries, please equip the people you associate with how to handle this, how to not get caught up in the politics of it. And it's time for the church to arise in unity. And I just want to thank all of you for joining in. So if you would, Bless one another as you all um, leave the Zoom. And I just want to thank you again for everybody who presented today. God bless you guys. Bless God you. bless everybody. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Everybody bless you. Bless you. Bless you. God bless you. Yes. Bye, everyone. God bless everyone. Yes. Bye. Thank you so much for your wisdom, your knowledge, your presence.
Amen. 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 Praise God. Bless him. Bless you guys. Yes. Amen. Thank you.